We will hear with the ears of faith today. We will hear what the Spirit of God says today. Not just what men say, but what you say. Lord, I thank you. You're teaching us on the inside. You said we have need that no one teaches, but you teach us. The anointing teaches us. And so we make a demand on that anointing that is present in us to teach us today. And I thank you that as we're taught the word of God, we will be transformed into your image in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So being that this is Easter weekend and today is Holy Saturday, we're in a series called Kingdom Reset, but I wanted to tie it together. I just thought, well, basically what we're doing is we're going back to the beginning of when the kingdom of God was established for us. Now, we had it in the garden, but that was lost, and then it had to be reestablished or reset. And so that's what we're going to talk about today is this part of the kingdom reset, what Jesus did. Now, you guys know what happened on Thursday night. That was the, the Lord's Supper. That's where the Lord washed their feet and they had communion together, which we'll do at the end of service. We'll take communion together also. And then on Friday, we call it Good Friday. That's when all the physical bad stuff happened to Jesus. That's when he was arrested. That's when he was brought before the Sanhedrin. That's when they mocked him. That's when they took him over to Pilate. And Pilate says, I don't see anything wrong with him. I'll, I'll give him to Herod. He's under Herod's jurisdiction. Sends him over to Herod. Herod says the same thing. I can't find anything wrong with this guy, right? So he sends him back to Pilate. But the Jews are stirring everybody up, trying to get them to treat Jesus as a criminal and get him terminated. And so anyway, so Pilate gets back with him. And so that's where we're going to kind of pick this up. We're going to pick it up on Friday. I want you to see what happened on Friday. And so in Matthew 27, starting at verse 27, it says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Do you see the humiliation? It's beyond cruel what they're doing. I mean, it's bad enough some of the things they're doing, but they're, they're mocking him. They spat on him and took a reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, the New Living says when they were tired of mocking him. <laughs> they got tired of mocking him. That's how much they were doing it. When they had mocked him, they took the robe off him and put on his own clothes and led him away to be crucified. And we'll skip over to verse 45. Now he's on the cross. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. This is interesting to me. I don't have any huge revelation about it, but I, it reminds me of some of these thunderstorms that we see in Florida where the, the sky just gets really dark and angry even in the middle of the day. And so when we're talking uh, the sixth hour, that's noon. So from noon to three, it is dark. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now they thought he was calling for Elijah. And some people think that he's asking God this question, like, God, what are you doing? Why are you, facing, why are you forsaking me? And that's not what he's doing. He's quoting the first passage of the psalm. That's what the priests would do. They would, they would recall the first lines of the passage, the prophetic passage, which I encourage you, read Psalm 22. It talks about the piercings and all of that, very prophetic of this moment. He's pointing to this moment where God gave him, who knew no sin, mm -hmm. to be sin for us. He's pointing to the moment. He knows what's going on. Yeah. He already had that settled in the Garden of Gethsemane yeah. when he said, not my will, but your will yes. be done. He was looking for another way. Father, is there another way to do this? Yeah. Nevertheless, yeah. right? Amen. You remember the conversation. Yes. Now go over to John chapter 19, and we'll pick it up in John's gospel. It's interesting when you, you really have to look at the four gospels, because each gospel will have information that the other ones don't. One time, this was 25 years ago maybe, uh, early 90s, I took the four gospels and made from the time that he was arrested until he was uh, resurrected, 
and put all you know passages from each one so it read like one story. I can't find it. I wish I could. But uh, it's pretty interesting. I might do that again, but it was pretty neat. But you really need all four. You know, for example, after he's raised from the dead, Matthew's gospel said that many of the saints were raised from the dead. Yeah. People saw <laughs> people that used to be dead yeah. alive, hmm. right? Yeah. I don't fully understand that, but that's what it says, right? Only Matthew's gospel says that, so you really do need to look at all of them. Did you have a comment before we jump in? There? Yeah, th this thing about um, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's, you know... I've listened to, and we've even said it, what a statement. He made him, created him, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. I've heard people say that's a mistranslation, and, oh, no, it really meant this. I don't think so. I think that just like we are made a new creation, yes, Jesus was made sin. And we can see that pointed to in John 3 where he, Jesus says, just like the serpent was lifted up. I was just thinking that. I'm going to be lifted up. Do you know what, it, that bronze serpent, that's a pagan symbol. When God had Moses do that, God wasn't like, they'll think of me when they see the snake. <laughs> no. That's a pagan symbol. God made him who knew no sin a pagan symbol that deserved all of the punishment that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Amen. What a trade. Yes. What a trade. I mean, because we, you know, I think it's important to highlight this because we focus on, and rightfully, our righteousness and what we've been made. But it's worth focusing on what he was made on that cross for us. Yes. The great swap is worth uh, thinking on. Yes. Amen. That's really good. Really good. Well, in John 19, we'll start reading in verse 28. It says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now, it's interesting. The What happens, he's had so much blood loss. That is a symptom of blood loss. He's now over in anemia where you get thirsty. And then it says, now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there and they filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a hyssop and put it to his mouth. Now that's insult to injury. What you really desire is water, right? And they're going to put sour wine. It goes from, yeah, it's vinegar, right? It goes from grape juice to alcohol to fermented wine to spoiled vinegar, okay? It's the last thing you want, right? So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. He gave up his spirit. He gave up his spirit. Don't miss that. In fact, in John chapter 10, don't turn because we're going to continue here in uh, John 19. But in John 10, in verse 15, Jesus said, I laid down my life for the sheep. Then in verse 18, he says, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. Jesus decided the moment he would die. He died on the cross, not of the cross. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now he would have, had he not chosen it, his body would have stopped because of the crucifixion. But he gave up his spirit. He gave his life. That is a big deal. That's yeah. huge. Okay, verse 31, John 19. Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Now, this is, again, cruelty on top of cruelty. The cross, the way it's designed, it's designed to suffocate you. Eventually, you fatigue to the point that you no longer want to push up on that nail and catch your breath. And we were listening to Rick Renner. He said by 15 minutes, the shoulders and elbows were out of their sockets. It's, it's just brutal. It's absolutely brutal. But they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, and they did not break his legs. That was prophesied. 
Not one of his bones would be broken. That's right. That's why he gave up his spirit, because they would have broke his bones, right? Mm -hmm. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. Now, this is a phenomenon that happens when your heart explodes. So he didn't die of suffocation like the others. He died because his heart ruptured. Some would say he died of a broken heart. Now, go over to John 20, and I'm going to reference something. Now, on, on Saturday, I tell you what, you go there with me. And keep, keep your place there in John, but go over to 1 Peter 3. You got a comment? Sure. Yeah, I love uh, when it says he, he rested his head and gave up his spirit. Um, there's another place when Jesus first began his ministry where they were um, asking Jesus where he lived and all these questions. And he says this statement, the son of man has no place to rest his head. Right? The next time he used that phrase was on the cross. Hmm. Or when he enacted, it's the same word in the Greek. He found rest in dying for us. He wasn't going to lay his head down on this earth until it was for us. That's what his, uh, his mission was. And I also love the fact that um, with the sour wine, you know, he just took communion with the disciples before, right? And he said, I'm not going to do this again until I come back. He took on what we deserve, the sour wine, that we could drink the new wine. Mm. There's so many trades in here. You could just keep going and going and going. But that, I personally believe that's what that's talking about when he drank the sour wine. That's what we deserved. We don't deserve the new wine, the Holy Spirit, that refreshing, right? Again, it's the great swap. It's huge. Amen. It's huge. Now, now we're going to talk about what happened on Saturday. So he's died. They put him in uh, Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. He's in the tomb of a rich man that was prophesied. Lots of prophecies that were fulfilled. Fulfilled In uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, we'll read verse 18 and 19. It says, For Christ also suffered once for sins. How many times? Once. And it's for every sin. Mm -hmm. Every sin. Mm -hmm. Even sins you haven't committed yet, mm -hmm. they're already paid for. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Now watch this. We've been talking about the great swap. Look at the next few words here. The just... For the unjust. There it is. I mean, that is the gospel in a nutshell right there. That he might bring us to God. That's the result. That's the goal yes. is to get us to God. Yes. Which is eternal life. Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Now watch this. By whom also he went and preached to the Spirit's in prison. This is the only place that this is mentioned. What is that? Jesus went into hell yep. and he preached to the people in hell. Amen. The righteous dead in the old covenant didn't go to heaven. That dispensation was not yet. They went down. So what you have, you have this compartment known as Sheol. It has two uh, parts. You have Hades. That's the place of the wicked dead, or we call it hell. The other side is paradise, or Abraham's bosom. And you remember one of the thieves, he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Yes. So he went there. It says in Philippians chapter 2, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. They've been waiting for him. I believe he went in there and he's walking around. Do you believe I'm the son of God? They say, yes, we believe you're coming with me. And he led captivity captive. That's why they saw people alive on the day of his resurrection. That's why. Yeah. Ooh, I got help. I don't fully understand that. I wouldn't try to spend a lot of time. Like I said, that's the totality of what the word has to say about this. But he, he moved that compartment up to heaven. Now, when we die, we go to heaven, right? To be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord in heaven. Even heaven, though, is a temporary dispensation. That's not the finish line. The finish line is when he brings heaven back to earth. He moves the new Jerusalem. 
headquarters. Earth is here forever. It's the inheritance, right? The meek shall inherit the earth. That's, our, that's ours. The earth has he given to the children of men. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. The earth has he given to the children of men. See, that's what the devil was after. That's what he was after. He was trying to pollute the stock of the earth so that Jesus couldn't be born. He was after the earth. That's the prize. This is headquarters. Now, I know we get a new earth. Some people think they're going to blow it up like they did in one of the Star Wars movies, Alderaan. You know, make another one. No, no, he's going to refurbish this earth. That's what he's going to do. He's going to refurbish this one. We're out of here for about seven years, and we get to eat. Yes. That's good news. Jesus. That is good. It's Kenny's barbecue will be at yes. that marriage supper. We're gonna, I'm sure. Brisket, ribs. Oh, yeah. Amen. Come on. Uh, amen, Alex. Right? No Weight Watchers up there, right? <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Glory to God. Down here, we got to watch it. But up there, I don't think it's going to matter. Praise God. Anyway, I don't know. I, I'm just thinking about that meal, right? Yeah, let's move on. Move on. But while we're away enjoying ourselves... This is going to get fixed. Yes. This planet is going to be restored. Yes. And he's going to put it back to the condition that it was before the fall of mankind. Yes. And this is where it's a reset. Kingdom reset. There you go. There you go. Glory to God. Amen. Um, did you have something? I know you, yeah. you got to have something. <clears throat> you want to hear about the goodness of God. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. yeah. It is true that he went to the righteous dead in the prisons. During this three days he was dead. But I want you to pay attention to something in 1 Peter 3 here. Uh, go to verse 19. It says, By whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison. What's that next verse say? Who were formerly disobedient. Ooh. He went to the unrighteous too. Mm -hmm. mm. Yes, sir. And he pulled them all out. Amen. Hell was empty for a while. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Oh. It, I mean, that's Romans 5 right there. He went to his enemies mm -hmm. and said, this is who I am. Amen. Do you believe? Boom. Blew the gates of hell wide open. Yep. Amen. Yes. I just thought that was worth mentioning. I've actually, I didn't notice that before in that context, but he didn't just go to the righteous. He went to all of them. Mm -hmm. yes, Amen. Wow. Man, I'm tempted to share something. I'm, I'm going to hold it. I'll hold it. we got a video to watch. Yes, I'll hold it. Sorry. I always do that, and then everybody's like, well, share, please. I'm like, no, no, I'll ask me later. Yeah. Go, did I tell you John 20? Yes. yes. Okay, now we're getting to Sunday morning. Okay, you guys ready for this? Yes. Now, have you ever noticed, we, we think uh, it's three days, but if you add it up, it seems like it's two days, because he's crucified on Friday, then you got Saturday and Sunday. But he's raised on the third day. But also remember that the integer zero didn't exist. See, we went from 1 BC to 1 AD. There was no zero year. So they, you, when they say three, they're counting the Friday as one. Okay, so normally we'd say three days would go Saturday, Sunday. Okay, but Friday they count as one. You see that? Okay. Now, so it says in uh, John 20, starting in verse one, now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. I try not to comment, but I have to. It's just so glaring and it's worth mentioning. Who is writing this? John is writing about himself. And you might be thinking, you egotistical thing, you. But I don't think so. Because holy men of God spoke as they were moved Amen. by the Holy Spirit. And I just believe that John, his writings, especially 1 John 4 and John 15, 14, 16, mm -hmm. those talk about the love of God in a way no other place in the Bible talks about. I know Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 13, the great love chapter, but John had it. And I think this is how we should refer to ourselves and weigh the disciple whom Jesus loves. There's nothing wrong with that. But I am glad that he's speaking in the third person rather than going, and me, who Jesus really loves, you know, no. And said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple, John, and we're going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. 
Now you can see this. There's a little, oh, yeah. they're like brothers. Can you tell? They're not brothers, but they might as well be. And there's this little tit for tat kind of thing. So for some reason, John just wanted you to know that he was faster than Peter. Right? Uh, let's see. Verse 5. And he, stooping down, looking in, saw the linen cloths lying together, yet he did not go in. Now watch this. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. John, imagine it. He gets to the tomb. I ain't going in. And Peter, he just ran right in. Did, did you see the difference? Okay. We'll let Peter go first. If somebody's going to get hurt, it'll be him. Yeah. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. And so uh, we're going to watch a video. We actually watched it in school this week, and it's a special or a documentary. It's not a Christian documentary uh, put together by TLC, I think it is, uh, Turner. And I edited it down from 53 minutes to 23. So it's about the Shroud of Turin. And I was surprised how many people had not heard of that shroud. And the reason we're doing that is I was talking to Anita on Friday. She goes, oh, are you going to show that tomorrow? And I said, well, you know, I've been thinking about it, but I guess I will now. So uh, I find it very, very interesting because it does show you an anatomical x-ray and forensic blueprint for somebody who went through all the things that he went through. Remember that when the Romans scourged, they would either scourge you, flog you, or they would crucify you. He got flogged because Pilate was saying, okay, I'll whip him, I'll beat him, and I'll let him go. And they're like, no, you crucify him. And that's why we want Barabbas. He even found that loophole. Hey, we can, we can release one of your own. We want Barabbas. So Pilate was steadily trying to get Jesus off of him. And he even got, he got the revelation, this blood's not on my hands. He didn't want to be responsible for that, right? Did you have something before we watch the video? Um, yeah, with this uh, Shroud of Turin thing, how many, just by show of hands, who knows what we're talking about? Shroud, everyone, excellent. Um, you know, it's one of, it's, it can be like a hotly debated item. It, whether it's the thing that wrapped Jesus or not, even though I believe it is, um, this gives us an incredible insight into what he suffered. Um, and that's the real thing to take away, is that um, it's an unimaginable amount of abuse yeah. that he took. And, um, and just remember while we're watching this, this is for you. This is for me. Yeah. That's, what, that's the main this thing. This was the trade, yeah. 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 Praise God. Well, go ahead and roll that video. Scientists are again pressing their attention to the old question. Is this an image of the crucified Jesus? Modern technology has opened up new avenues in pursuit of the shroud. In 1898, the church permitted examination of the cloth by the impersonal eye of a rather new invention, the camera. No one could have expected that the photograph Segundo Pia took that day would change forever the way people saw the shroud. For as the photographer's glass plate emerged from the developing solution, he saw a face, a distinct clear face, unlike anything ever seen before on the shroud. He understood at once that the shadowy image on the cloth had been a negative and that he was now looking at a positive He held in his hands an image that would launch a century of scientific investigation. A hundred years after that first photograph was taken, the city of Turin prepares for another public display of the cloth. In that time, it has become the most studied artifact in human history. A new high-tech home is being prepared for the shroud. A hermetically sealed case of aluminum and glass from which the air is pumped out and the inert gas argon pumped in. When the shroud is placed in here, 
It will never be rolled up or casually handled again. Unseen by the public and documented only by a single camera, a Swiss textile expert carefully stitches it to a new backing cloth, inch by inch. On the Shroud of Turin, there are three types of markings. The most obvious marks are scorches from a fire that almost destroyed the Shroud in the Middle Ages. Then there is the anatomically correct image of a man, front view and back. And third, what appear to be bloodstains. The bloodstains match biblical descriptions about the torture and crucifixion of Jesus. The beating, the crown of thorns, the spear wound. But is the blood really blood? And how did the image get onto the cloth in the first place? The persistent mystery surrounding these questions has challenged scientists for generations. Students at this college in Glendale, California, get a special glimpse into the ongoing debate about the shroud. Their professor, Angelo Montante, uses the shroud as a teaching tool. This is one of the most amazing cultural uh, artifacts that we find in the history of Western civilization. Clues can be drawn out of it that gives us a perspective on the past. The Bible does not give us details dealing with the crucifixion of Jesus of Nazareth. But let me call your attention to the spot right here where there was bloodshed. If classical paintings were correct, he should have been nailed through the palm. But he wasn't. He was nailed through the wrist. And there has to be a reason for that. And we know what the reason is because of some research done by a French physician. In Years ago, a French surgeon experimenting with cadavers was able to determine that the palm cannot maintain the weight of a human being. It has to be through the mesocarpal region of the wrist. Something else is important in this regard. When you nail a person in that area, you press on the median nerve. And when you press on that median nerve, the thumb goes in. And if you'll notice, you do not see thumbs on the figure at all. That's a very accurate kind of thing. How could a forger have possibly known that? Here we have another enhanced image of the shroud. This darkened matter represents blood. Here, more blood on the arms. And then the whole torso is bleeding. On the side of the torso, near the fifth rib, is an unusual exudation of blood. It matches the shape of the Roman lancia, which was in use at the time of the crucifixion. There is a lot of blood on the shroud, so much so that it makes you wonder at the cruelty of the Romans, that they inflicted such pain on this individual. Cruelty shown on the shroud far exceeds most artistic versions of Christ's passion. Why would a forger have displayed so much more than people expected to see. Short streaks of blood on the back and legs of the man on the shroud baffled researchers for years, until it was noticed that they exactly matched the peculiar shape of the first century whip, the flagrum. I'm holding in my hand a replica of a Roman instrument of torture. It's called the flagrum. And at the end of each thong, you find these dumbbells. Notice that there is a space between the two dumbbells. We can determine the severity of the wounds of the man on the shroud because of the anatomical accuracy of the image. An image so accurate, it can be read by a modern physician. This is a quarter size negative of a picture of the shroud um, and it appears to be a middle-aged male. If we assume that blood is going to appear white, there are other things that will appear white as well. But if we As a specialist, Dr. Zalut is used to examining x-rays of acute trauma victims. There's areas of bleeding um, diffused about the scalp, both in the front and in the back. 
There's areas in the chest, again, in the front and in the back, that uh, look as if there's been bleeding. You can see that there's been an injury to the left wrist. You can't see the right wrist because the left hand covers the right wrist, but there appears to be an area of injury to the left wrist with blood on both forearms. Um, the posterior portion of both legs and the buttocks are covered with blood as well. In both ankles, there appears to have been some bleeding as well. It's impossible to say what the cause of death was, although there's multiple areas of injury, any one of which could have uh, been fatal. The specific wounds are consistent with only one cause of death, crucifixion. In the late 1970s, a group of scientists pressured the church to let them examine the shroud with the latest technology. An agreement was finally reached, and the Shroud of Turin research project, STIRP, was on its way to Italy. STIRP was, a, was put together primarily with the purpose of examining the shroud to determine how the image was formed. But we had the big problem of never being able to see the thing we were to examine until we got there. It was like an expedition into a, an unknown part of the jungle. We brought with us a, a host of technologies. Virtually every type of imaging that we had available to us to determine how the image was formed. I thought that I was going to be able to walk into the room, see the shroud unveiled, walk up to it, look closely, see the brush strokes, and go home. Vern Miller was another of the scientists involved. He also started off with a skeptical attitude. The first time I'd heard about the Shroud of Torn was from Barry Schwartz, which I thought was a fairy tale of some type. But Sterp's uh, objective was to find the mechanism that caused the image to appear on a piece of linen cloth and uh, not to authenticate the cloth as the burial wrapping of Christ. So relieved of that responsibility, we could look at it in a much more objective way. I didn't know what the shroud was at the time. I'd never heard of it to my knowledge. STIRP member Don Lynn took time off from his regular job as director of JPL's digital imaging program for NASA. At the time we were working on the Viking program, which was a soft lander on Mars. We basically had one day to set up the equipment, get it unpacked, set up, and calibrated. And that night, we were supposed to get the shroud around midnight. And of course, about 11 o'clock, a little early, very unusual, the shroud was brought down the hallway into the room. One of the first experiments that was done on the shroud was to separate the cloth from its backing cloth uh, in a small area, about four inches. That allowed us the first look at the backside or the underside of the Shroud of Turin in 400 years, and this image is the precise moment that they took their first peek at the back of the shroud. Then Professor Rigi of the Italian team inserted an endoscopic camera between the two claws. When I saw that focusing light underneath the number three blood stain, I turned off the room lights, he turned on the focusing light, and we saw for the first time that the blood stains had actually soaked into the cloth the way blood would, and the image did not. Right away, a significant discovery. When viewed from the front, both the image and the blood are seen clearly. But when light is shown through the back of the shroud, the blood is visible, but the image is not. That was something we didn't know until that moment, which meant the image could not be a painting, or we would have a density of paint on the shroud that would show in a transmitted light photograph. We were all anxious to find if the blood was real or not. When I first viewed the, the shroud during those tests, uh, the blood did not look real to me. The blood looked quite red and fresh, other than something that was supposedly 2,000 years old. 
to determine if this was real blood. We took samples uh, on a sticky back tape and then examined it in a laboratory much later. It was not until several months later that we determined that this was real blood. Okay, in the next slide, we show the actual blood on, on the, the weave of the cloth. This, uh, is this the blood of Jesus? Is it the blood of another person who happened to have been crucified by the Romans? Is it the blood of an innocent man taken to create an extraordinary hoax? One of the theories of image formation on the shroud was that it might be a scorch because the color is something like the scorch color of an ironing board cover. In normal light, both scorch and image look the same. Since all scorches fluoresce under ultraviolet light, we imaged the shroud using UV photography. We did not see body image. We got wonderful images of all the scorches on the shroud, but the body image didn't show at all, proving that the body image could not be a scorch. As to what might have caused the image, the scientists ruled out possibility after possibility. Microanalysis of the threads that were brought back determined that the color change of the threads was due to a chemical change, uh, dehydrated oxidation. Uh, but we do not know what caused that chemical change. The stains on the cloth are remarkably subtle and complex. One fiber will be discolored, while an adjacent one is not. Yet each fiber is only one-tenth the diameter of a human hair. And in some places, the image only penetrates to one five-hundredth of an inch. There is no known way of replicating such markings on a cloth. Most experts are now convinced that the image was not painted. In the search to understand how it was created, scientists placed it under a machine called the VP-8 Image Analyzer, a unique device used by NASA to interpret photographs from space. If we place a perfectly normal young man's picture under the VP-8... Any two-dimensional image, such as a photograph or a painting, will not be read properly. The shape of the original object will appear distorted. The hair, which we know to be over the brow, is actually sunken because it's darker. Whereas the face, the cheeks, are actually elevated because they're lighter. A photograph of the shroud should be distorted as well. But it isn't. When this image was seen for the first time, scientists were amazed. It was perhaps as dramatic a moment as when Segundo Pia saw the negative image of the shroud for the first time. We notice that the nose is above the cheeks and that the face is of the proper dimension, the beard and the hair. The VP-8 analysis was a breakthrough, establishing that the image was formed while the cloth was draped over a three-dimensional object. In recent years, subtle images of flowers have been discovered on the shroud itself. This area of research has been vigorously pursued by Dr. Alan Wanger of Duke University and his wife, Mary. Wanger developed the hypothesis that certain off-body images on the shroud were impressions of flowers. He came to this research from the work of German physicist Oswald Schurman. Um, he noticed these, but I didn't see what he was talking about at first. But later on, I noticed the image of a, a flower very close to resembling a chrysanthemum. And as I backed off and looked around, I began seeing many of these images uh, on the shroud. Obviously, these were banked in around the body at the time of burial. The purpose of the flowers is not known. Perhaps as a fumigant, since the body was hastily buried, or perhaps just to honor the dead. In addition, we were able to, uh, to uh, determine the uh, flowering time of these, and uh, uh, all of these flowers bloom in either March or April, which, which indicate uh, that this was the, the time of uh, Passover, the, the time of crucifixion. In 1973, the Swiss criminologist Max Fry was permitted to take samples of pollen from the weave of the shroud. He preserved them on glass slides, 
Trained as a botanist, he spent years analyzing their pollen content. Of the 58 pollen types identified so far, 28 of the plants exist only in the Middle East. Proof that the cloth spent part of its history there. There is another Gundelia right now, if you know. The slides have revealed an unusually high density of pollen from a plant called Gundelia turniforti. This particular sample came from an area next to the head of the man on the cloth. You can see the spines, okay? Here one, here one, here one. And the plant that left so much pollen in this spot on the shroud can be recognized by its flower, but it's better known for something else. I have to use my knife because it's a highly spiny plant. This is a Gundelia turniforti. Uh, the thistle the, um, uh, that uh, has the highest frequency of pollen grains on the Shroud of Turin. This is a cave just outside of Jerusalem, which is probably very similar to the type of cave where Jesus himself was buried. Uh, it would be closed with a large rock, a boulder most probably, and that's how the Christian Bible actually describes the burial of Jesus. When the Sturp team examined the underside of the shroud, they found that some pollen grains could not be identified because they were coated with a mineral. This mineral was subsequently analyzed and traced. And investigating the mineral, they discovered that it was a limestone of sorts. A limestone very, very rare and indigenous to an area outside of Jerusalem. With regard to the carbon dating, there is one more factor which, if it occurred, would definitely have thrown off the results. Radiation. If what I am told by physicists is correct, it's a projected image. And in other words, it's almost as though the body were floating in the middle of the cloth and all of the projection comes off at right angles to the body. This image is directly collimated from the body. That is, it's parallel and parallel to gravity. This is so unique that it has to be explained as a radiation phenomena. And as we rotate back Radiation forth, may be the only way to explain recent findings that the image is like an x-ray, revealing internal structures of the body. Uh, we are seeing the, the bones, the metacarpals, uh, here. Even more striking, as we shift up to the wrist area and rotate back and forth, looking here, we can identify the individual wrist bones on the shrouded Turin. We see skeletal features in the depth of the body consistent with some type of x-radiation. And so we feel that the image, other than the direct contact with it from blood and so forth, is basically a, a formed by uh, this a remarkable and unique situation of radiation. Superimposing a skull over the face of the shroud reveals internal structures with remarkable clarity. Uh, we can see that we are seeing the images of teeth here. As we shift back and forth, we can see on the shroud here are the teeth, roots and all, uh, and what is the source of the radiation? Even as we go Some researchers feel they have the answer to that one, too. I believe this image is on the cloth because of the transformation that occurred during the resurrection. The body transferred from one medium to another, and in so doing, it left a recoil. And it's just such a recoil of particles radiating from the body that marked the image on the shroud. 
That's why we get the three-dimensional effect and other things. What does that? I don't know. Let alone, how do you get that kind of energy out of a corpse? I knew people were going to ask me whether I had any great religious experiences or anything like that. So I sat down about three o'clock in the morning, and very quiet, there weren't anybody around, and looked at the shroud and said, okay, how do you feel? What do you feel? Uh, no, I had no great religious experience. Uh, I didn't, uh, you know. But the one thing that kept really sinking into my mind was looking at the face as opposed to the body. The face has a very serene, peaceful look. Uh, and the body is terribly beat up. Uh, the two just don't go together. Our team spent hundreds of thousands of hours. And after that period of time, remembering that our primary goal was to go and determine how the image was formed, came back with nothing, could not answer that question. So in essence, we can tell you what it's not, but we cannot tell you what it is. Jesus or not, that's up to you. Um, when I was teaching that in school, it's the one thing I made clear. You know, we're not here to try to convince you that this is an image of Jesus, but it sure does seem like God to leave a, an x ray. Mm -hmm. uh, how was that created? Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And just what you were saying, you know, when, when Jesus said he, he, he rests, has no place to rest his head, yeah. and then it says on the cross, he rested his head. Mm -hmm. That's what he was struck by. This is a NASA guy who's not, he's just looking at it scientifically. And he's like, those two things don't match. But that's what you see is peace. So I just thought it was interesting. It does line up exactly with the brutality and the cruelty that we see within the crucifixion. So in closing, I want you to go over to Hebrews chapter 9. Did you want to comment on the video? How many of you got uh, blessed by that? Yes. You know, um, the only thing I wanted to say is sometimes um, people who don't believe the way we do or just people who are not believers, they call what we have blind faith. And that's never described that way in the Word of God. We're not blind. We're actually made to see. Mm -hmm. And faith is based on evidence. God wouldn't ask us to believe in nothing. And it's like him, you know, just like with Thomas. We call him Doubting Thomas. Um, it's not fair to him, actually. Uh, I think he was in a condition that a lot of people are in today, and that was, I want to believe that, but I need to see it. Yeah. And you know what? Jesus was merciful. Yeah. He said, okay, here it is. Here's the holes. Here's the hole in my side. He was merciful, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think this is an extension of mercy for that very type of person that God is, has embossed with that resurrection power the image of his son into that cloth so people can see he was real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's not the only thing. There's Roman records of execution for a Jesus of Nazareth. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have historians outside of the word of God that observed him in action. They observed his death, all of these things. And it's the mercy of God. He wants people to believe. <laughs> and so it's okay. You know, what we believe is based on evidence. We believe in something real. We don't, like Peter said, we don't believe in cunningly devised fables. We're talking about what we have seen and tasted and observed. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. And, and speaking of evidence, my, my friend Tony Nardella, most of you know him, he's been to the church several times, a missionary, but he's also an attorney. And the one statement that he made is that the strongest evidence that you could ever produce in a court of law is an eyewitness. And in Corinthians, it says that Jesus was seen after his death. He was seen alive by over 500 people at one time. Mm -hmm. That's 500 witnesses. There were a lot more, but it's over 500. So that's evidence. All that's evidence. Mm -hmm. and, and I like it. So praise God. In uh, closing, Hebrews 9, look at verse 
11 and it says but christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is not of this creation so jesus goes into heaven to offer blood and we know this happened on the day of his resurrection because in the morning he told mary don't cling to me because I've not yet ascended to my Father. That's right. But go tell my brothers, I'm ascending to my God and your God. Okay? Then, later the same day, he's telling Thomas, handle me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See? The, the first order of business was getting that blood to the mercy seat in heaven. Okay? Then it says, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption yes, yeah. once for all and i love to ask the question what does that mean is it once for all people is it once for all sin or is it once for all time yes, yes. the answer is yes, yes. to all three yeah. it's once for all and it says here having obtained eternal redemption mm -hmm. which means time is not a consideration when you say eternal you have pulled off the time factor the time sensitive time sensitivity to the redemption anywhere in time that sin would occur it's redeemed yes. Amen. it is redeemed you are redeemed yes. i am redeemed we are forgiven mm -hmm. even things we haven't done yet yep. that's what it says yeah. isn't that good news yeah. that's the good news yeah. that's the gospel and so he was raised from the dead people saw it that shroud pretty interesting to me you know, I think that as his body came back to life, boom, that Mel's movie, uh, The Passion, remember The Passion of the Christ? It, it shows that, that cloth kind of floating down. That's really good, Mel, because that's, that's what I see. You know, I, I think he passed through that cloth. You know, who knows? I don't know. But uh, anyway, it's, it's a phenomenon they can't explain. The one thing that I can tell you is they can't disprove that it's Jesus. They've been trying. It's the most studied artifact. In human history, that's an amazing thing.